we need radical examples to shake us out of apathy. I think that we are born into a world in which we conform to certain ideas and ways of thinking. And forwardism to me is a disruptive way of thinking to start to see the future differently, uh, which is what we need to do. We can't make the world better with the same thinking that created the world that we have. And so it's just a kind of radical disruption in the way we think about the future. We've had a, a way of thinking and that's created the world and we need a different way of thinking to create a better world. Forwardism. The joy of seeing and feeling tomorrow before it's been created. Continually challenging convention. To push for certainty of a better experience when we get there. This is Forwardism. Hi everyone, my name is Yomi Adegake and welcome to This is Forwardism, a new audio series by BMW for those who live for tomorrow today. In this series, I talk to brilliant creative minds about what they're creating, shaping and designing. Together with my guests, we are trying to put the pieces together to create a picture of the future and we want to know what their definition of forwardism is and what it means to them. So who is our guest today? Well, today's guest is the one and only Douglas McMaster. Douglas is a chef shaping the future of gastronomy. He was awarded Britain's Best Young Chef by the BBC and awarded Britain's Most Innovative Chef by Young British Foodies. He's worked at some of the best restaurants in the world and then in 2012 worked under the legendary Zero Waste Visionary Juste Bucker. In 2014, Douglas came up with the idea to open the first zero waste restaurant in the world, Silo, a restaurant that exists without using a bin. He's a pioneer in the kitchen, the founder of a movement and the creator of a food system for a sustainable future. I hope you guys are as excited to hear from Douglas as I am. Douglas, welcome to today's episode. How are you? Hello, Yomi. Um, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. That was a very flattering um, introduction. So yeah, it's just a, it's a pleasure to be here talking to you today. It's an absolute pleasure to be speaking to you. And that introduction, I mean, it was factual, so clearly very much, <laughs> very much deserved. Well, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Can you let us know a little bit about you in a nutshell? What, in fact, might surprise listeners about you? Sure. Well, I I guess I am a chef and I guess I have achieved the things that you did just list, but I'm not, um, the way I see things is, is, is quite different. Um, I wasn't very good at school. I'm dyslexic and I think I have ADHD and at school, I was just the least academic person in that school. And that that's um, sometimes quite difficult on a on a young on a young mind on a teenager, and uh, I guess my self esteem was was quite low as a result. And uh, when I left uh, the age of sixteen, I sort of ambled into a kitchen because I didn't really know what else I could do. You know, kitchens are salvations for those unacademic folk who don't have qualifications. To be a chef, you don't need, all you need to do is work really hard, um, <laughs> sacrifice your social life and uh, accept that you won't be paid very much. Um, all of which I just willingly sort of um, accepted and uh, induced myself into the world of gastronomy. And so maybe that's something that um, you wouldn't expect after your introduction. So, so yeah, I hope that answers that question. That answers it brilliantly. And I think if anything, it actually makes your story probably more inspiring and relatable to our listeners. So thanks so much for sharing that, Doug. My pleasure. So our podcast is called This is Forwardism. When you received our invitation to come on, what did the phrase forwardism, if anything, mean to you? I think that we need radical examples to shake us out of apathy. I think that we are born into a world in which we conform to certain ideas and ways of thinking. And forwardism to me is a disruptive way of thinking to start to see the future differently, uh, which is what we need to do. We can't make the world better with the same thinking that created the world that we have. And so, yeah, it's just a kind of radical disruption in the way we think about the future. That's that's how I interpret the brief. We've had a, a way of thinking and that's created the world and we need a different way of thinking to create a better world. 
What is it about your journey that embodies the concept of forwardism? And why do you think we wanted to speak to you, given we're, we're speaking to, you know, pioneers and people who we think um, very much align with that concept? I think my journey is um, a unique series of events in which I had a m motivations along the path that have shifted my perspective to a unique position that has motivated radical innovation. So I could talk in more detail about what that perspective is, but it's, yeah, it's the seeing something that you realize that not everyone else sees. And it's when you see something, you can't unsee it. And when you see something that's a problem, you can't then ignore that problem. And that's why I've created a, a restaurant that aspires to to not have a bin, because I've seen, a, uh, I guess, a perspective of a, of a food system that is horribly wrong. And I'm trying to innovate based from that perspective. And I think it's this unique kind of combination of perspective and reaction that is why you're interested in uh, featuring me today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's one of the many reasons that we wanted to speak to you. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your work in, you know, various different restaurants. You've really worked in some of the best restaurants in the world, including St. John, The Fat Duck. What did you learn in these restaurant kitchens? I learned some serious things. <laughs> um, I learned what was wrong with the world or with the industry, um, which is kind of the same thing. I learned that, that humans are obsessed with this idea of perfection and that it doesn't exist. I learned that to create what we might understand as perfection, which I would argue is definitely not perfection, the way to achieve that is an industrial way of thinking and in a way of doing things. And what I mean by that is in an um, industrial system, you create variables which are the same um, so you can have consistency in the way in which the thing is made. Now, in a fine dining kitchen, the greater the, the restaurant i.e., you know, the higher it was acclaimed, the more it was like a factory. So imagine a 50 cover restaurant with 50 chefs in it. And those 50 chefs would do, instead of doing six to 10 jobs in a day, they would do one or two. Now, because those chefs are doing one or two things, they can do it, quote unquote, perfectly. And so these fine dining kitchens are more like factory lines. And that was, uh, yeah, this aspiring um, perfectionism that um, I sort of fell out of love with because of this toxic environment in which these restaurants are predicated. So, yeah, I sort of learned what it takes to achieve this sort of world-class perfection. But then I learned that that was all kind of a, 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 a sort of toxic and meaningless. Right. And I was very lucky to to meet this artist. Um, it's a very difficult name to pronounce, uh, but Yost Baka. <laughs> So oh gosh, I was I was I was further off than I hoped. <laughs> in the uh, it's all right. It's all right. But uh, Yoast, it's like toast with a, the letter Y. Yoast, um, and and he came at a very important time when I was working for one of the world's best restaurants in Sydney. I was working eighteen hours a day, being shouted at, and it was aggressive and violent and mental, you know, uh, psychological um, warfare. Mm. And then I met this artist, and it, it was a kind of revelatory vision that he had that that I um like a moth to a flame was attracted to and that really was the beginning of the rest of my life thank you so much and I just want to take you back to that moment and I suppose that conversation all those conversations that you had with Yost that made you sort of decide that you wanted to change the way you worked and cooked do you remember a specific moment or was it more of a kind of gradual changing of your perspective and outlook that made you decide that you wanted to innovate the way you were working? I think there was many negatives that, that occurred in my life that I didn't necessarily know were connected. And then when I met him and saw his project, 
there was this sense of, and there was a particular moment where I walked into this um, building in Sydney on the um, the harbour. So you had the Harbour Bridge and the Opera House. And he, this guy Yost, had built a, uh, a structure out of waste materials. And um, it was something out of some like dystopian Mad Max style film um, that I'd never seen before. And it was kind of crazy, but beautiful. And yeah, it was a building made out of waste that was designed to grow food. So on the roof, there was like a, almost like a mini farm, uh, big cucumbers hanging over the edge of the, the side and thousands of terracotta pots with wild strawberries growing from them, um, aubergines, tomatoes, beehives. Um, you had this big kind of industrial um, spinning cylindrical compost machine. So it's quite techy as well. And inside this building was these kind of mad prophecies written on the walls, on the ceilings, like some crazy cave dwelling. Um, <laughs> yeah, sort of moment. And I remember being in that space, loud music blaring, and there was something in the atmosphere that captured my imagination. And I just knew that this was going to be the rest of my life. Wow, I'm doing my best to imagine what that looked like. <laughs> and I'm I'm trying, but yeah, it sounds absolutely incredible. So can you talk to me a little bit about how the idea of silo came about was it soon after that that you decided that you wanted to start that up all credit to this guy yost i i, I don't want to like undersell myself as uh, not having some you know original of ideas course. but uh, <laughs> but uh, but yost um was the was the person who said he, he had this like premonition he had this i would even go to say in a kind of clairvoyance he 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 said could you not have a bin if you track that question through his perspective, I'm sure it's not as as profound. You know, he made a, a restaurant um, out of waste materials that was growing food and it had a, a food system within it that wasn't necessarily zero waste. They had a bin, you know, they, it wasn't zero waste. So in his mind and his kind of pathway of thought, yeah, it made sense to then question the next chef you meet. Could you not, you know, right. use a bin? How could you do that? <laughs> so that was his his brilliant thing. But from my perspective, I was a 22 or three year old chef who was a bit down and out. Um, I was sort of giving up, losing hope with the whole industry, with what I was doing in my life. I felt massively unfulfilled and lost. And then I met this 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 amazing, you know, futurist, and um, he said to me, "Could you not have a bin?" And I didn't know what that meant, but I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortune favors the brave. Since then, that was 10, 11 years ago, and I'm I'm committed to this idea of not having a bin and I, I, I guarantee I'll still be thinking and trying to unravel the puzzle of not having a bin in decades to come. Mm. Thank you so much. I mean, it, it's, it really is fascinating stuff and especially the time sort of line that, you know, it was t 10, 11 years ago, which does very much feel ahead of its time. Um, yeah. And, you know, as you said, it's something that you'll be looking towards continuing doing in the future. Um, I'm just fascinated in terms of breaking down how it actually works. Um, what, for instance, happens to leftovers? How do you navigate not having, I mean, it's just one of those things you don't really think about, but when it's presented to you, how about not having a bin? It's like, oh, wow, how does that actually work? How does the food get to you? How is it processed? Um, how is it, if not rid of, how is it put back into that ecosystem? Tell us all about it. So before we deep dive into the, the finer details, one thing I like to do is draw a perspective. So this is what happened to me. And, and earlier I mentioned this kind of radical examples to shake us out of apathy. This is something that I, I'm quoting from a Batman film, um, <laughs> uh, The Dark Knight. Um, Great film. Very, very good film. Um, excellent philosophy. But it's relative to this because, you know, you, you said just then, uh, Yomi, that you don't think, you wouldn't have thought about that. Now, the, uh, the bin, uh, landfill, waste, is hidden. It's literally hidden from our, our, our lives, our, our, our vision, our knowledge, our awareness. We don't see it. It's hidden. And that's 
you know, why we're so apathetic, as, and I'm not speaking about me and you, but generally as a society, we're apathetic towards waste and nature. Mm. We are kind of detached from nature. And this kind of loops back into this perspective that I mentioned earlier being the sort of the the point of view that I design from or this thing that I can't unsee. And so that perspective is that we are nature, uh, me, you, and every other human in the world. We are nature. We are part of nature. But something that that humans do is is an abstraction. We've created things that don't exist in nature. Um, so waste is something that is a human design. Waste doesn't exist in a jungle or in a desert. It, it's a human thing that we've created. I won't get too technical, but I have gone d- d- deep diving into like the synthesis of materials to become something kind of non-natural. Mm. But to to park that and just to say that, you know, we've designed waste into this world. So it's our responsibility to design it out again. And waste is an indicator of unsustainability. You know, waste indicates something that's not sustainable. So it's really pertinent thing to con- to contemplate, to think about and to to not be apathetic towards. So my job with that perspective in mind, that thing that I can't unsee is designing it out. And so it's kind of the answer is in the you know in the substance itself like nature like we need to reintegrate with nature to not have a bin. Now that sounds lofty as hell, and it and it is um, super aspirational. It's not something that you can click your fingers and do. So to sort of then go into like some examples. So plastic is the biggest kind of uh, culprit, the perpetrator. Which um, it's a non-natural material that doesn't biodegrade. It's not part of nature, um, and that is pure waste. Um, there's recyclable bits of plastic, but let's not go into those details. But essentially, we're designing out plastic. We're designing out polystyrene. Mm. We're designing out single-use materials where possible, and where single-use materials are uh, part of our system, they are biodegradable and fed into a biodegradable system, i.e., composting, or in some cases anaerobic digestion which is where you basically convert waste into energy to take a step back and just say the way we achieve zero waste or let's say 99 percent zero waste is three kind of main pillars direct trade so getting everything from nature because from nature things are not wrapped in plastic so if we want milk or cream, we get it from a cow in a field and right. that, that milk or cream is put into a, a stainless steel pail. And because it's coming in directly from that dairy farm, we can give them empty pails back when they deliver the pails full of milk and cream. So you've got this circular system in which um, it can endlessly be refilled and reused. Um, and so that's an example. Vegetables coming in you know, reusable crates and so on and so forth. So everything comes directly from nature. The second pillar is whole food preparation. By default, nothing is pre-processed, so we can like make everything from scratch. And then thirdly is composting or anaerobic digestion, you know, turning waste into uh, energy, basically. So those three things is a kind of trifecta of zero waste. Now, that's not a perfect system. That's a very broad stroke of how to mitigate 99% of waste, or let's say 95, just to <laughs> cover my back. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I hope that all makes sense. And I know that's quite a lot to think about, um, but it all connects in intimately. Um, so I wanted to sort of say that all together. Yeah, no, it makes perfect sense. And it's oh, absolutely fascinating. Um, and I think it makes so much sense that I, I know, as you said, it, it's not yet a perfect system, but it does make you think that I suppose in many ways, why isn't it something that's done more or at least thought about more across the board, which I suppose is an entirely different podcast episode. We, we, we wouldn't uh, yeah. be able to cover I, it in, uh, in the time. You I have. would say, I would say that it was the thing about seeing and not seeing, you know, the apathy or, or, or awareness. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's when you know it. For instance, if you bought a product and then you learned that that product has all kinds of like, uh, I don't know, child labor or all kinds of right. like really horrible things, you would never buy it again. 
hundred percent. I totally hear it because I feel like, for instance, it, within this conversation, I feel like that that dichotomy has kind of been. I suppose I've certainly been aware of, of of God society's level of waste, but I think when you look at what can be done to mitigate it, it is for su- certainly someone such as myself quite an eye-opening um thing to hear just those pillars in particular um so thank you so much for for sharing that that is food for thought hopefully for everybody and i think another thing that is super impressive is the fact that the interior of the restaurant is um dedicated to upcycling and you know it has chairs and tables um made of um repurposed wood and plates made of plastic bags i read there's cushions made from old jeans that's incredible and i suppose just going back to what you said about it being often 99% or 95%, we're going to cover you back there in terms <laughs> of it, of, of um, how far you're able to go. Would you say when it comes to upcycling, um, is there anything that could be done to, for instance, in that space um, within the restaurant, is there, are there any ways that you could be even more sustainable, push, push it to that 99 slash 100%? Um, is there anything else that you hope to upcycle further within that space? So I guess I just want to take a little moment just to mention this uh, upcycling. And I'm really glad that you use upcycling and not recycling just to create that distinction. Uh, Recycling is where we turn something into the same thing. So like a glass bottle into a glass bottle or a can into a can. Recycling is a really important system. But upcycling kind of goes where recycling cannot. So Mm. there's a lot of materials that can't be recycled and upcycling can sort of take that weight and and do really amazing things. We have a restaurant made out of waste materials and these waste materials are particularly these things that are anomalies within the system and materials that yeah can't be recycled and would just have otherwise gone to landfill and been really kind of bad. So the restaurant is made out of waste. Um, so to give some, yeah, some examples, there's a lot of upcycled plastic, a company called Smile Plastic, my friend Adam, uh, basically makes these beautiful big sheets, kind of like big sheets of wood, but made out of compressed uh, waste plastic that would have otherwise gone to landfill. But these materials are stunning. You'll start seeing them pop up in some of the most sexy design studios across London. They're stunning. And yeah, we've got a bar top and tabletops and um yeah and um the thing that I'm the most proud of is the what we do with our glass. So a wine bottle, a single use wine bottle is coming from different parts of Europe and it's a single use material because we can't send that bottle back. Lots of logistics, supply chain headaches, basically. Um, So we have to accept the inevitability of this single use glass bottle. And many years ago, I was was contemplating this glass bottle and thinking, right, this is not reusable. It's not compostable um, and it's not edible. (laughs) So what can we do with this? And Basically, I had this idea. I was sat on a stony beach and thinking, where's the sand on this stony beach? And then thinking about this uh, problem of the single-use glass and thinking, what if I could turn glass back into sand? Could that then be a raw material to create something new, like a metamorphosis? Mm. And it was this, again, abstract. uh, There's a lot of abstractions in this tale. Um, (laughs) But it is an abstraction that, that doesn't exist in the world that I thought this is so interesting and that was five years ago and now we have a pottery above silo in the restaurant um, which is dedicated to processing single-use glass into uh, materials that we need oh my god so when you walk into silo you'll see (laughs) without knowing it about six different um, objects within the peripheral view uh, that are made from our waste glass including plates, light fittings, tableware, um, crockery, that is all made from waste glass. And these are beautiful, magnificent creations made out of our, our waste. Phenomenal. I mean, honestly, the way you describe it, I mean, that sounds like a kind of eco Willy Wonka-esque <laughs> utopia that I would love to visit. It just sounds fantastic. As you said, lots of abstractions, lots of kind of, I suppose, thought nuggets that then, you know, maybe in that moment don't necessarily feel viable or possible, but it's phenomenal to just watch you kind of bring them into reality over the years, Um, which makes me wonder, I mean, I assume you've had lots of innovative and boundary pushing ideas, but not all of them 
I imagine can be implemented. You've been able to turn, you know, single use glass bottles into, <laughs> into crockery and plates, but what innovative plans have you not been able to do or have you had to say goodbye to along the way that I suppose is still, is still something that you hope maybe one day you'll be able to bring into reality? There's so many to know. Um, the one that does spring to mind, uh, many years ago, we had a system uh, we, I called Jesus water. Um, <laughs> so the Jesus water was water that's uh, tap water that goes through reverse osmosis, which is essentially a fancy word of saying that like a really, really, really fine water filter. And then that really uh, clean water gets go, goes through electrolysis. And that electrolysis um, basically destroys 99.99999% of bacteria. Now, this water can then clean and sanitize a whole restaurant or, or anything that you need to clean or sanitize. Water could then be this magical um, thing that can clean. Now, it t- sounds too good to be true, and it's halfly half true it is uh too good to be true it's a technology that was born in japan and we had this japanese big kind of unit that looked a bit like some sort of star wars villain <laughs> um and uh and it, it basically it, it died a horrible death uh which is a terrible shame on me moment because i p- paid a, a plumber to um basically took a shortcut and made a big mistake and destroyed this beautiful machine that created yeah jesus water and um sometimes dealing with innovation is incredibly taxing so by nature innovation is hard um you're doing something that's not been done before right. and you're kind of weaving together many innovations and when there's innovation there's uh, misunderstanding there's uh, confusion and there's problems there's stress i think that of all the things that i've done there's been about I want to say a 50% success rate. In the early days, it was a 10% success rate. And over time, it's getting a little bit better. It's more like a a, a 70% success rate. But that is the the nature of innovation. And without being mindful of that, the zero waste gods have shown me mercy over the years, (laughs) Yomi. Um, I'm very fortunate that Silo hasn't gone under because, you know, surviving at a 50% success rate is not good for business. Doug, thank you so much for your time this morning. I could quite literally speak to you about this all day. I know that you have to go, so I promise I won't. (laughs) But I have one last question, um, which is everything you've discussed already sounds so futuristic, especially to my mind and sounds like, you know, we are discussing a restaurant in 2050 as opposed to now. But I would love to hear about what your vision of zero waste cooking and restaurants in let's say 2050 would look like. What would your utopia be? We already know that Jesus Water will be up and running. So what else would be part of that vision? Nature, nature, nature. So nature is um, what we need to understand and Nature includes natural farming systems, materials that are from nature that are designed to go back into nature. Through industrialism in the last 50 to 100 years, we've detached from nature. Um, Our thinking, our behaviour, you know, cities are, or industrial spaces are a, a detachment from nature. And where industrialism breeds, nature dies. It's literally the nemesis of nature. So it's appreciating that, having that perspective, that insight, and then designing nature back into the world. You know, the the system, like being closer to nature, uh, children understanding nature, understanding what produce is, how to grow produce, where it comes from, you know, creating an awareness of nature back into the minds of the whole society and reintegrating it. What does nature want? How can we how can we give nature what we want to have a sustainable future? Because if we don't ask what nature wants, we won't have a future. Thank you so much, Doug. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Um, I'm so sad that <laughs> we have to end this here, but... Um, Yomi, please come to Silo. I am desperate to come to Silo. I'm deadly serious. I'm absolutely desperate, even if it's to steal a cushion made out of jeans. <laughs> <laughs> 
But the the thing I didn't mention is the food, and um, I'm lucky to have an amazing team of uh, chefs and the front of house as well. They're all absolute rock stars, and the product that we're putting out is really, really special. And all big shout out to the Silo team because they're all heroes, and you will see that when you come to eat, Yomi. I'm absolutely holding you to that, Doug. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Guys, sadly, today's episode is already over, but as ever, we'll push forward. Um, so stay tuned for our next episode with another exciting creative mind to give you a sneak peek of what tomorrow might be. In the meantime, my name's Yomi Adegake, and this has been This Is Forwardism. <laughs>